Hey guys, it's Roger Shepard. Really excited to have a conversation with my friends Bob and Chaz today. Before we get into that, I want to let everyone who's listening know that East Entire and Sumo Logic are going to be at RSA coming up at the end of the month, April 24th. We'd love to meet you there. It's, send us a note and we get, we're happy to set up some meetings or at the very least come by the booth, get some swag and just listen to the story. We both have a great story and a great visual story we'll talk a little bit about today. And then secondly, we'll also be at the, uh, the Channel Partner Expo event and MSP Summit, which is going to be the following week, May 1st, there at the Venetian in Las Vegas. So East Entire will have a booth. Simulogic will have a presence. If you happen to be at either of those events, please let us know. Bob and Chaz, smart guys, love talking to you guys. Uh, if you don't mind, Bob, introduce yourself real quick, then I'll go to Chaz, and then we'll kind of get into the conversation. I, I'm, I'm excited to talk to you today. Yeah, no, this is going to be fun, Roger. Thanks for inviting me. So, yeah, I'm Bob Layton. I'm Chief Channel Officer for eCentire, and I control all of the alliances and channels around the world, which has been a lot of fun, especially in a, in a massive growth phase. And um, eCentire is a really good partner of Sumo. We've got a fantastic working relationship, which is why I'm just so excited to participate today and uh, get into the conversation. Awesome. awesome. Yeah, Chas Clausen here. I'm field CTO over security at Sumo Logic. I've been here about four years now. Um, my background is primarily in the SIM SOC consulting space. Uh, one of the things I love about my current position is I get to work directly with customers, those guys in the trenches fighting the good fight, and then, you know, partners that are also leading the empire. So good to be with you guys. Good to chat, chat with Bob as well. Awesome. So let's get into it. And I'll, I'll ask a tough question to begin with, Bob. Cyber resiliency, is this just a way to sell more security or is this something that should be thought about independently when an organization is thinking about their own infrastructure? Well, it's always about uh, exposing ourselves so we can sell more, right? But no, I think honestly what's happened, Roger, is that people have gotten tired of hearing all the acronyms and all of the buzzwords. And cyber resilience is, is a way to really change the conversation, to talk about how you can anticipate threats, withstand any kind of attack, and then finally recover if you must. And the market is absolutely pivoting toward, toward that conversation, which is a very real conversation about outcomes. And it's not about trying to baffle people with, with three-letter acronyms. So that... It, Look, I, I, I really enjoy having the conversation every single day with clients, and I would much rather talk about anticipating threats, withstanding um, attacks, and recovering than I would try to remember, you know, whether or not someone knows what XDR or MDR means, right? So, so Chaz, how would you define cyber resiliency? So the thing that I love about the term cyber resilience is it fi I think we're finally at the point where we're going to assume breach, right? And in yeah. order for something to be resilient, it means that it's going to be tested, right? Just as, you know, a bodybuilder would tell you, you go into the weight room, you have to muscles, you have to stress your muscles, you have to tear those fibers in order to, for it to get stronger. Um, and to Bob's point, like we're, there's so many acronyms thrown around um, and a lot of them are, are pushing, you know, we can prevent this, we can prevent that. The reality is, um, you know, breach happens, unfortunately. Um, and I'm substituting the word breach for, for other four, four letter words that, that might be appropriate. Um, but for cyber resilience, right, it means that you're designing a comprehensive security stack and, and um, you know, I guess fusion center, if you will, that can get, can, can leverage continuous improvement, right? Learn from your mistakes, automate anything that can be automated. Um, improve your detection technology so that the next time around you actually have, um, you know, detection strategies in place that will catch what you missed, right? So I think I like the way that, that things are moving with, you know, addressing this complexity of cybersecurity. And, you know, er nobody wants to be on the headlines, right? You don't want to be, you know, the guy that, that missed a breach or, or was part of a, you know, a serious incident. Um, but when we realize we're kind of all fighting this fight together um, and, and it's going to happen, but build your, your systems in a robust way so that they can recover. So, Bob, how would you differentiate this from somebody who cares about, I, you know, I need to be compliant. I need, you know, I'm looking at NIST. I'm looking at P2P. 
PCI or whatever it is that's, that's relevant. Is cyber resiliency built into those compliance standards or is it a separate conversation? Well, I think they're similar, right? I mean, uh, if you take NIST, for example, it, it's a framework that, that leads you to think about the problem in a, in a very unique sequence so that you can get to an outcome, right? How do you identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover? That's a very purposeful sequence of how to approach a methodology to protecting yourself. I think when, when we get into conversations with clients, one of the first things that we try to assess is, do we have someone that is buying for compliance reasons or do we have someone that is buying for just security's sake? And, and that really leads our conversation because if you're, if you're buying for security's sake, then you can take the NIST framework and you can simplify it to our message around anticipate, withstand, and recover. If you have someone who has deep compliance needs, you're going to want to actually talk about you know, PCI, you're going to want to talk about different aspects of the NIST framework. You're going to want to talk about how they operate their, their, their business. What part of the, uh, of the, of the market are they in? Are they in a highly regulated business? What, what are they trying to do? And many of them have some sort of good or bad experience with, with how they've been protecting themselves. So we always like to just open it up and say, tell me a little bit about what you do today. Do you follow any kind of framework or sequence? What's your methodology? And you really start to find out that security is not the same conversation for everybody. It, it's, it's very, very different. So I love having these conversations every day. And whether you're, you know, an enterprise buyer or a mid-market buyer, very quickly, you know, again, are you buying for compliance reasons or are you buying for security reasons? So, Chaz, when, when you're talking to, I know you do a lot of work with our partners and with our customers and have a lot of these conversations. Where are these questions coming from in organizations? Is this something that, you know, the practitioners are asking about? Is this something coming from the leadership, from the board level, across the board? I mean, where, where do you see this, this question and this conversation typically start? So, the... I think it comes from a lot of different places. You know, I, in fact, just this last week, I got in a little uh, kerfuffle with somebody from the Sumo compliance team where I just said, you know, we need to get out of doing compliance for compliance sake. And they actually found that kind of offensive. Um, and then it took a phone call conversation to, to really get down to, you know, we're all driving towards the same thing. We want to protect mission critical assets. And those compliance frameworks that, that Bob mentioned, they have, they're have they really driving us towards a finish line. And yes, sometimes we can get wrapped around the axle where we're doing the check boxes and you know, maybe over-rotating a little bit on adherence to different compliance regulations. Um, but a lot of these are based on best practices that have been proven over time. And so the business owners, right, those people that are, that are kind of driving the ship, they need to start somewhere. And so that's the map. That's the framework that they're going to push down to the security practitioners in the field. Um, and I think for those of us that are more hands on keyboard, we need to kind of let loose a little bit or, or maybe don't don't resist the, 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 you know, kind of the knee jerk reaction is, ah, oh, here comes another compliance thing that we're, that we have to adhere to. Um, ultimately, we're all on the same team, right? We're all defenders. We're all trying to, to as I said earlier, fight the good fight. Um, and so, you know, when those business directives come down from the top, I think we need to just understand them, right? And 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 that's what our role is as security professionals. Can can I add to that, Roger? For yeah, of course. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. So, you know, and one of the other things we're finding is is that, um, you know we're all in, in, in sales, right? But I think it, it's moved away from sales conversations to really being workshops and being a business dialogue. And I can't tell you how many times, especially in the last six months, we have conversations with a very diverse group of stakeholders in a room. And you have, you have legal in there, you have uh, security, you have IT, you have even one of the senior executives that might be sponsoring the conversation. And what we have found is a lot of times addressing security leads to operational, 
you know, reconstruction, right? Um, completely rebuilds of departments and how they actually map the functions and, and what they do, right? It's an organizational transformation because a lot of times um, people are trying to do more with less and they're trying to consolidate. And, and through that conversation, they really revisit why they first made the decision in the past to try to address a security problem or an IT problem or a management problem or whatever. And they realize that, hey, this is actually something we should be talking about all the time internally. Are we organizationally built in a way to, to go forward and, 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 um, and, and just operate the business effectively? And security is at the heart of that, right? Because if you think about security problems, um, legals involved, executive teams involved if you're if you're at the board if you're publicly traded it gets even more hairy so i love the whole workshop feel of it with multiple stakeholders coming into the room yeah and i think the other thing that i i really like that and sometimes we need a little bit of help translating between the security teams and the business stakeholders um the more that we can get out of viewing security as a cost center um, but rather a, an investment, right, in the business, I think that's better. So when I talk to, you know, those security practitioners that need a little help in this area, I always bring it back to understand the why. Like, what is your business really trying mm -hmm. to do? Don't make enemies, right, on either side, whether with the developers or the business owners. Um, stop saying no and do more explaining on, like, how. How do we level up? Um, because security can actually be a part of the value that you're bringing to customers, right? Um, people will pay premium prices for solutions that they know are secure, right? And so as those security professionals at the table, that's the message that we need to deliver. So I was looking at just some different articles and, and studies in, in preparation for this conversation and found one that said, 47% of organizations have not tested the effectiveness of their incident response program. Probably doesn't surprise you, it's almost 50%. For those that had an incident, it actually took them an average of a month to recover from, from that incident. Are we too focused as an industry on the first part of what you were talking about, the protect and detect and not focus enough on respond and recover? For both of you. Well, I love the Mike Tyson quote that says, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. Right. Um, so I don't think enough teams are doing validation of their controls. Um, you know, red teaming, blue teaming, purple teaming, breach simulation. Um, you know, I think those are critical uh, in proving out that, you know, bleeding edge, you know, MDR solutions that eCentire has with their Atlas or the Sumo Logic platform, we're going to bring to you a lot of very powerful out-of-the-box solutions in detection, visibility, observability. But really, the customer is the they they understand what the the critical assets are, what solutions are in their stack, and they have to take it to the next next step and validate that, right? And, and that has to be done on a continuous basis. And, you know, eCentire, Sumo Logic, we work with customers to help put together those continuous validation programs in place. But if you don't have it, you're honestly, you're flying blind and it's, it's quite dangerous. Yeah, and I think it's interesting that we all use the phrase stack, right? I mean, be, being in, um, you know, background around solution providers and, and MSPs and, and being uh, operator and owner. Um, we always use the word uh, stack, right? What is your stack? And when I think of a stack, I don't think of, I don't think of systems and outcomes. I think of, of decisions and basically items and, and infrastructure to manage. And in order to get to an outcome, especially if you're, if you're under attack or you're trying to, you know, anticipate what could happen. You want to get away from having a stack and you want to be in a, in a place where you're agile and you've got, you've got an approach to how you're going to, um, how are you going to respond to any kind of threat? So I think we're, we're starting to get people to open their eyes and, and realize that some of the decision-making frameworks that they had in the past don't hold up to how fast you have to be able to, uh, respond to threats, um, 
today and, and you can't protect what you cannot see. And so we're, we're trying to guide people to do more with less. So what do you think the role of a managed service provider is in providing cyber resiliency? Is it is that a conversation you have or are you just focused on kind of outcomes within those pillars? Yeah, no, look, I think I think a managed service provider is, is a personal choice. You have to see yourself um, dovetailing with them and making sure that you can have operating procedures that mesh. And that feels very different than making a product purchase, right? You're, you're purchasing services and commitment and a relationship and getting into a, a recurring relationship. So I think, you know, managed service providers of today are different than the ones in the past, um, you know, 10 years ago, it was about more managing up down status and just making sure that all of your stack was actually running. Now, MSPs are being held accountable to actually getting to outcomes and dovetailing with the operational runbooks inside of inside of the client organization. It's a very sticky relationship. And when it's done well, it, it's done very well. And when it's when it's not, it's it's very off base. One of the advantages that I think is often overlooked when companies can turn to managed service providers is they have visibility across, you know, dozens or hundreds of different security operations teams. And they're able to either provide or glean best practices from some of the most mature teams in the industry, right? Especially when that service provider is running on a multi-tenant platform like Sumo Logic, where you can actually do global intelligence across a very broad set of you know customers, um, and so they're able to absorb some of that complexity and then pass those best practices down to the teams that would otherwise be operating almost in a silo, right? Like you always wonder, you know, what is my neighboring business down the street doing, or or this competitor doing in their shop, well, that MDR can bridge the gap, right? And provide some of the, the insights that you wouldn't normally be able to get uh, in isolation. Yeah, and let me, let me add to that. Um, I think that, that people are starting to, to also realize that security is a data problem first and a human problem second. Right. And so when when they're looking for a managed service, they're really looking for someone who can tell that story of being machine led and human assisted, because there's really no other way that you're going to be able to keep up and work in time with how how these these threats actually penetrate and um, and propagate in, inside of a network. And so what we always like to understand is exactly what are your data sources? What are you trying to protect? Where are these assets? What cloud providers are you operating with? What what data streams do we need to take from that? And this is where our relationship with Sumo comes into play, right? Because you have to take both high fidelity signals and contextual signals and drive that thing to an outcome. So when you, back to the original question of a managed service provider, if your managed service provider is not using language like this, then you're in the wrong room, right? Because it's very much about you know, what are these human beings going to be able to do if I give them the right data and how fast can they do it and deliver that outcome? So when you hire, I mean, if I go out and search for MDRs, there's a, there's a bunch of them, right? I mean, it is a, yeah. it's a crowded space. A lot of them talk about detection. A lot of them talk about response. I always say sometimes it's big R, sometimes it's little R. I mean, because the response that they're doing is you know I'll call the customer and let them know there's a problem, or I'll send them an email. That's not always very helpful. How it, how do you sift through that and measure the effectiveness? I'm you know I'm trying to hire an MDR. I'm doing the right things. I'm asking the right questions. But ultimately, how do I differentiate between the ones that are actually going to get me where I want to be versus the ones that aren't? How do you, is there a way to measure that? Because there's no objective cyber right. resilient standard, right? Right. Well, so what I would tell you is. First of all, managed detection is somewhat uninteresting because it's been done for the last 30 years. It's really in that R, in that response, where people start to differentiate themselves. And and what is that differentiation, right? You have to be able to act in real time 
and press that kill switch inside of an environment to actually stop something. And you also have to be multi-signal. You have to be able to stop and press a kill switch in lots of environments on lots of different data, data streams. So if, again, if, if your provider is not having that simple a conversation with you, with that much brevity, then you're in the wrong room. I think you, you've got to go out and choose the, these relationships wisely because the, the threats move with such velocity now that, the, you know, just choosing the wrong provider is really going to be a tragedy. Since we've been working with eCentire, I know one of the things that comes up frequently is um, moving moving away from just the response as well into proactive security. As well. So, um, you know, building out threat detection models that help the customers level up, right? Because, you know, it's easy to see the smoke from a smoking gun or an explosion, right? And then play the role of the fire department. But ideally, your service provider will also be able to do a deeper analysis and, you know, help you, quote unquote, shift left, right? Be able to put the controls into place um, that will prevent, hopefully, the next bang. Um, so I think, yeah, I think it's a twofold, twofold approach. Yeah, So absolutely. I can throw you guys a curveball. Because I, I was working with this, one of the things I was looking at was um, I was trying to write up a definition for myself on cyber resiliency. So I went on to uh, chat GPT to <laughs> define cyber resiliency. And the answer was quite good. And I searched for that answer. And it wasn't writ It was not a copy and paste. It was a th it was an answer that took several different inputs and created a whole new being, you know, a whole new um, paragraph on that that had never been written before the, by chat GBT. Where I'm going with this? Where am I going with this? It's only a matter of time before they weaponize that. And I, it, where, because chat GPT can also write code. And so I think we are very near a time where somebody with nefarious ideas, but not capabilities, can leverage AI, weaponize it to either try to send phishing attacks or write code where they can insert themselves into an environment and steal data. What are, what are we doing as you know an ISV and as a managed service provider to prepare for that day? Because I think <coughs> it's coming. Bless well, you. So Bob, Bob actually summarized it well from the Defender space where we have to aggressively move from a human-led process to a machine-led human-assisted. Um, what's interesting about that is the attackers are thinking the same thing, right? They're all in a room somewhere, probably not in LinkedIn Live, um, but they're discussing how do we weaponize a lot of these tools, these automations to level up our game, right? Because there's a, there's this a high dollar game at stake here. And Chat GPT, I just wrote a blog article last week about leveraging Chat GPT and these other large language models to create that polymorphic code and create, you know, flawless phishing emails, right? No more Prince of Persia that needs money sent, right? With a lot of spelling errors. We're talking about flawless phishing attacks that are written in context of the business that you work at, even what your personal role is. Like, how do we determine that this on the other end of this email is an attacker? So it's gonna become very difficult but what we have to do in this kind of cat and mouse game is level up, right? Just along with the attackers as they're using automation, we need to use automation. Um, and I don't see any, I think, I don't see any way around that. And, and it's gonna require a lot of, you know, investment and expertise to kind of move into this bleeding edge um, cyber defense space. But but I'll turn it to Bob. I mean, I think, I think you summarized it nicely and, um, you know, and I know artificial intelligence is something that eCentire also incorporates, but maybe you can speak to kind of your perspective from a service provider there. Yeah, I think, well, look, both both Sumo and eCentire have some some pending announcements in, in, in this area of, of chat GPT. And I think our, our customers are wanting to hear it. Right. But a couple months ago, I, I stood on a stage and I was giving a talk and I said, just imagine what if you could actually speak into into an interface and say what is the most logical and disruptive attack 
when you've already launched Log4j? What is the most vulnerable part of an organization that has already had business email compromise in the executive team? You know, like boom, boom, boom. And it's basically instructing you, where can I go and buy this this, uh, exploit kit on the open web or on the dark web, right? So there's all kinds of sinister ways that you can use it. But when you think about automation, just the word really points toward agility and anticipation. And so I think if if you're looking at what's the most modern approach to this, you have to have a, a, a data-based agile platform that can anticipate and withstand. And so when you have these human assisted models that are running off of uh, machine learning and, and continuous learning, we have thousands of customers uh, in over 80 countries around the world. So when we learn something that's happening in Jakarta, or in Sydney, Australia, and we're able to pass all of that back across our our platform, that's not human people on the interface spreading those protections. That's us putting in automations that go through and will do sweeps so that we can protect all of our clients from from something, right? And that goes back to how we partner up with Sumo because Sumo actually organizes that data so that we can apply the automations and get that into our machine learning models. we're we're entering on, into a time when when chat gpt is just the tip of the iceberg yeah, uh, right. it's going to get way more sophisticated from here i'm personally hoping that it means the end of email because i think email's <laughs> way too thick and i hate answering email there's got to be a better way and then maybe we can just do away with uh, business email compromise right so or it'll just be automatically written you know yeah. look at a history of your email for the past month and probably respond right. to everything from there on out it, so we, we're about done on time. I mean, this has been really great. It's, it's a good conversation always, you know, flows faster than you think, right? But um, I, I was thinking for the last 60 seconds um, for each of you, because we got about two minutes left when I'm done with this question. Take 60 seconds and just tell me something that you're worried about, but close on something you're optimistic about in this coming year relative to security in general and, of course, cyber resiliency. I'll start with you, Bob, and Chaz, let you close it out. So I'm, I'm worried about uh, mankind, if, if I can sound a little silly for just a minute. I'm just worried about the, the breakdown of society. I'm worried about all the wars and disruption and, and monetary policy and politics that are going on in the world. It just seems like it's just too easy right now just to be angry at the person standing next to you. And I think the, the oh, you thing went that, deeper I, with that than I thought. That, that was pretty yeah. deep. I know. I know. But, but I think the, a place of optimism is, is that every single day I get to talk to people and, and I'm, I'm encouraged, right? Everybody's trying to improve their organizations. They're trying to protect their users, protect their customers. And above all, and this is my key word for the year, is experience. They're trying to improve the experience for their right. customers and their employees. So I'm going to go global um, in the same way that Bob did. Um, the thing that I'm probably most worried about is the unknown fragility in the systems on which we built and rely on every day. Um, and, you know, to earlier to our discussion, I'm not sure that they've really been stress tested um, with some of these new cyber threats, I- including chat G- GPT and others. Sure. Um, but I would hate to feel like we're one breakdown away from collapse. And in some mornings, you know, reading the headlines, it does feel that way. Mm-hmm. Um, but on the other side, you know, I've always thought it's a false premise that, you know, defenders have the harder job because we have to be right every single time and the attackers only have to be right once. The good news is it's not quite true because once they're inside, it's flipped in reverse, right? They have to be right every single time or we're going to pick up on those indicators of compromise that Bob mentioned, right, that are happening in Jakarta they make one false move, or as they're moving laterally across the environment, there's a lot of places for us to have detection strategies in place and then identify those attackers and then take the proper remediation. Um, so that's that's the good news, I guess. That's the, the optimistic view. Um, you know, they're, even the most you know savvy, skilled attacker is going to be in your environment where you have tripwires and canaries and things set up to identify that, um, you know, and, and we're here really to help you guys level up. If you feel like your security strategy has gaps, um, then let's have that frank conversation. Let's figure out and identify those gaps 
and there might be ways for us to, to at least plug a few of those holes. Awesome. It's great to talk to you guys. Looking forward to seeing you both at RSA. And uh, certainly, again, if anybody's going to be out there, come by, say hello. We'll, um, or we could be to the bar and buy you a drink. We're happy to do that as well. <laughs> there so, you go. Uh, great to talk to you guys. Have a wonderful rest of the day. I look forward to um, talking to you soon. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Roger. Thanks, Thanks. Chaz.